new co-executive director of the Texas Democratic Party. We just want to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to talk about a very important subject and how we can protect our communities across the state. As a longtime organizer and activist, today brings me so much hope about what we can accomplish when we unite, especially for our communities. Today, we're joined by some of our strongest leaders in communities all across the state, by elected leaders, by educators, by parents, by medical professionals, who are all coming together today for one common goal. Um, and we're discussing an issue that should not be partisan, about protecting our children, protecting our teachers, and protecting our communities as well. Houston ISD, Austin ISD, and Dallas ISD have all pushed back against Governor Abbott's executive order this week. This decision by Governor Abbott puts millions of children at risk with the pandemic. We hope that in our time today, and that we will show how school districts and how local municipalities and community leaders are leading and speaking out against this ban, and that our governor must recognize the crucial importance of, have, of keeping our schools safe. So just a couple things as we begin, I'd love to share with the press that have joined us today that we want you to ask questions. We ask that you use the press box here in the Zoom and we'll facilitate a Q&A after all of our speakers have shared their stories and their perspectives. We ask that as you put your questions in the chat that you also share what outlet you're um, representing as well. And then again, for our speakers, if we keep our remarks to two to three minutes, um, we wanna make sure that we hear all perspectives from various communities across the state. So as we get into our speaking program, we're, we'll be speaking about the COVID protections and Governor Abbott's recent executive order that bans local health authorities and local municipalities and entities from making decisions that benefit their communities and keep them safe. And so as we kick off our program, I will introduce our first speaker, Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins. Judge Jenkins. Jamar, thank you. Thanks for having me and for all the work that the party is doing uh, to make Texas stronger. Uh, yesterday evening, I brought a lawsuit in my official capacity, a counterclaim uh, in a lawsuit where I'm being sued by Ken Paxton and a local Republican commissioner uh, who believe I don't have the authority to require masks in the commissioner's courtroom against our governor in his official capacity. And that lawsuit seeks to uh, invalidate portions of GA 38, which is the governor's order that restricts local government and school districts from requiring masks in indoor settings and other actions that local government and others can take, including private business, uh, can take that the governor is seeking to restrict. Essentially, uh, the argument is that while the government, the governor has brought authority to um, suspend regulations in furtherance of a disaster response, as you saw when he suspended requirements for out-of-state doctors to practice here in the beginnings of COVID, the law does not give him the authority to um, create uh, restrictions for local government to respond to an emergency. Nowhere in the law is that power given to him. We'll be having a hearing on that in a little over an hour, and I'll be leaving shortly uh, to work with lawyers uh, in preparation uh, for that hearing. It's very important to understand, although I've taken the step of suing the governor, the enemy is not the governor and the enemy is not your unvaccinated neighbor or someone who disagrees with you. The enemy is the virus. We're all on team public health. Um, we all need to be on team public health. The, the governor has made a decision that he will not respond to the COVID uh, surge of the Delta variant. Um, but if he will not do so, we need him to get out of the way so that those of us uh, who are unafraid to respond uh, can do that. Now, one last thing I wanna tell you before um, I get off of here is this Delta variant is much more contagious than anything that we've seen before. And doctors tell me if we do not uh, 
it, do these mass mandates in our schools, in our uh, businesses, and in our grocery stores and other venues where people uh, go to do their business, that people will die unnecessarily. In fact, this Delta variant now makes up 97% of the cases in North Texas, up from 12% just a month ago. It is infecting people at a rate of five people per one person who gets sick. And to put that in perspective, at its worst, the original variant got up around two people for every one person. The doctors may talk about this, but we have what's called the R factor or the R not factor. If the number is below one, our, our uh, cases decline. If it's above one, our cases increase. When our cases were increasing dramatically at its height, those numbers were around 1.6, 1.7. Folks, we're now three or four times as high as those numbers, depending on what county you're in. So the time to act is now. And this is about saving lives, not about politics and not about lawsuits. We're going to have to use politics and lawsuits to get there. But this need not be partisan. Uh, uh, my hope is that uh, local officials will stand up for their communities, more superintendents, and that some Republicans uh, will stand up uh, and uh, join with doctors and and uh, be for public health and be for their communities. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jamar. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Judge Jenkins, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for your leadership. So next up, we will have the chairman of the Texas Democratic Party, Judge Gilberto Hinojosa. Uh, thank you, Jamar. Um, and I'll be brief. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, folks that are working uh, at the forefront of this crisis uh, with us today, and I want to give them a chance to express themselves. The first thing I want to do is I want to thank Judge Jenkins, uh, Judge Hidalgo, and all the judges across the state of Texas that are fighting hard to protect their communities using all the resources they have to ensure um, that the people that live in their respective counties um, are protected from this horrible virus. I also want to thank all the educators who are uh, um, coming up um, with a challenge that they have never seen before. Now, not only do they have to teach our children uh, and educate them and, and, and make them strong, you know, critical thinking individuals that will lead Texas into the future, but now they have to protect them at the same time from this horrible virus to make sure that they do not get sick and, and also that they not get sick and take it back home to their families. You know, when 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 you when you are in public service like these judges are and these educators are, um, a, a lot of times you're faced with challenges that you never would have expected uh, that you would be chained, uh, faced with. And you expect that the leaders in your state will back you up and try to fight uh, to protect the people that you represent from the problems that they may be encountering, such as this horrible virus. Never would we have thought that the, our own governor, the governor of this state, would not only not help you, but pre prevent you from trying to help your own people prevent you from making sure that your children in this state are safe from this virus, prevent you from ensuring that as a county judge or a, a mayor in the state, that 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 uh, you are trying to in, in, uh, implement processes within your community to protect the public. We never expected to have a governor that instead of trying to help us is hurting us. And he's doing it for political reasons because he wants to ensure that he gets elected in his primary, which is uh, uh, controlled primarily who, by people who are anti-vaccine people and anti-maskers. Um, his, his concern should not be his primary and his political future. His concern should be the children of our state, um, the people that live in our community. Uh, he needs to, he doesn't have the power. He should not be exercising the power of, of, uh, as governor to try to prevent our leaders from protecting our public. Um, he should be exercising his power to protect the public. And for some reason, Mr. Abbott's got this all wrong. And the reason he's got it all wrong is because he's thinking about himself and his own political future than the safety and welfare of the citizens of the state. That is wrong. 
It is morally wrong. Um, it is politically wrong, I would think as well. Uh, and I hope that um, he get out of the way of our leaders like Clay Jenkins uh, and Lena Hidalgo uh, and our educators, uh, our superintendents, uh, our teachers, get out of their way um, so that they can do what needs to be done to protect the people of this great state and especially our children. So I wanna thank them for what they're doing and the hard work uh, that they're engaging. And I am very proud to see them standing up to Mr. Abbott, standing up to this failed leadership of this, this uh, uh, Mr. Abbott's administration and doing what's right because they believe it in their heart that this is the right thing to do to protect the children and the people of our community. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Chairman Hinojosa. Appreciate your comments. Up next, we will have the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Julian Castro. Thank you very much, Jamar, and thank you, Chairman Hinojosa, for your leadership. I also want to commend uh, Judge Jenkins for his leadership and filing a lawsuit and doing everything that he can uh, there in Dallas County to keep his constituents safe, uh, as well as everybody else who was on this call who I know in their own roles is trying to do the same thing. The most fundamental duty of a public servant is to help keep the people they serve safe and healthy. By that standard, Governor Greg Abbott is failing miserably. In fact, he's quickly turning Texas into the capital of COVID misery. As we look around the state today, hospitalizations are surging. The number of coronavirus, coronavirus cases is surging. The number of ICU beds in much of the state has dwindled into the single digits, including in some of our largest counties across Texas. The positivity rate and the hospitalization rate is higher today than it was when Governor Abbott issued his mandate, his mask mandate last summer. And just this week for many, many Texas school children, school started. Uh, I'm the parent of a daughter who just started seventh grade and a son who just started first grade. And these days should be uh, some of the most fun, exciting days for parents and hopefully for kids um, as they start a new school year and look forward to getting involved in activities and reuniting with their friends. But instead of that joy, the governor's lack of leadership has caused tremendous anxiety for parents, for educators, for families across Texas. And we see the numbers of COVID cases in school communities going up. Parents are worried about the health of their children while the governor hamstrings the ability of schools to fashion their own COVID safety precautions, especially by requiring, requiring the wearing of masks to keep children and educators safe. That is a terrible mistake that is gonna cause sickness and may even cause loss of life. As a former mayor, I know that oftentimes local communities, municipalities, counties, school districts that are closer to the ground have the ability to fashion safety precautions that are right for their communities. Teachers, educators, local school board members, council members, mayors, county judges across the state are begging Governor Abbott to rescind his executive order to allow them in their local communities to make the best choices to keep people safe, including requiring that masks be worn, which we know is an effective way to help stop the spread of the coronavirus, which is particularly important with this even more contagious Delta variant. It's time for the governor to rescind his executive order, to focus on keeping people safe instead of focusing on legislative politics and trying to arrest Democrats, instead of focusing on his GOP primary and trying to be as right wing as he possibly can. And I hope that other localities will follow the lead of Judge, Judge Jenkins, as well as the leaders of the Houston Independent School District, Austin Independent School District, and others that 
have sued the governor and are putting up a fight against these unreasonable restrictions that he's placed on local communities. What's at stake is the public health, especially of our children. And there's nothing more important than that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Castro. We appreciate you being here today. Uh, next speaker we will have uh, is Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas's uh, 18th Congressional District. Congresswoman. Thank you so very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm removing my mask here very briefly because I take masks and masking up very seriously. I, I have on my lapel um, a picture of John Lewis. One would wonder why I intermingle the two because I believe the fight that our Texas Democrats are doing is a fight for people to be able to have their voices heard and their vote, vote to count. But I can tell you that when people vote, they don't vote to die. They don't vote to elect individuals that would give them a sentence of death. In addition, let me welcome and congratulate all of the Olympians, many of them Texans, for the outstanding job they did in Tokyo. Those are young people. Many of them will be going back to colleges in the state of Texas. Uh, and those colleges will be fearful of putting in mandatory mass rules. I believe in showing town. This is a picture of a 11 month old in my constituency who had to be life flighted to Temple, Texas because there are no pediatric, uh, pediatric beds in this region. If there are, there are one or two. This little baby had COVID. The mother was unvaccinated. Thank goodness she is vaccinated today. So again, I proceeded to write the governor, still waiting to hear from him, and asked him to rescind the executive order that prohibited the idea of mandatory masks, and from my perspective, mandatory vaccines. If that is what the county judges and elected officials of cities and the excellent teachers that are on this uh, call think that is best for them and their children. The words are simply this, that to be frank, Executive Order GA38 consigns thousands of Texans to needless death and suffering, which according to virtually all public health experts could be alleviated by taking the simple but life-saving precautions of getting a vaccination shot, which is available to anyone at any convenient place or wearing a protective face covering. This is what the governor is prohibiting local jurisdictions from doing, college campuses and others. And in fact, a punitive measure of a thousand dollars, fining good public servants, penalizing them with a criminal response that says that they are going to be fined. The increase in children uh, having COVID-19 is absolutely uh, frightening. Uh, it is well documented, speaking to Dr. Peter Hortez, uh, that children will be the most targeted as relates uh, to those are non-vaccinated children as it relates uh, to the question of uh, COVID-19, the Delta variant. Uh, just a meeting I had with a doctor a few minutes ago indicated that his ICU is packed and something that he had never seen in his 30 some years of being a doctor in the ICU, five ICU patients died on one day with COVID-19, the Delta variant, the most contagious, the most infectious. So children, are our top priority, our teachers, and all those who work with children. They will be entering the school system starting today in our community. They'll be unvaccinated if they're under 12. We beg that those who are over 12, that their parents get vaccinated, that they get vaccinated. But it is clear, show and tell, the Delta variant is sending more children to the hospital. The reason why this little 11 month old had to be life lighted because not one single pediatric hospital, including Texas children, had one single bed for that baby. Is that what the governor wants to have on his hands? Is that what we are here in America? Is that what we have resulted to? Is that what we are here in Texas? The state that has, along with Florida, the highest infection rate and the lowest number of vaccines. This is a crisis. There is a pandemic. And this is a catastrophic crisis. Let me finish with this. I toured my public hospitals on Saturday. There were not enough nurses to take care of patients. There were 20 hour waits outside of hospitals. Why? Because the governor had not reached out to the federal government or to their state legislators or anyone 
to help with getting nurses where nurses were needed. So there were no nurses. What the governor did reach out to the federal government for is to get five, five mortuary trucks, trailers, to take dead bodies away from the unfortunate circumstance of dying because of COVID-19. So my voice is loud. It will continue to be loud. It will seek a clarion call. And that is, above all, children are our most precious resource. It is predicted that as school begins to open, there'll be a surge of Delta cases with children who will have to be hospitalized. I want to stand with those of you who are on this uh, call today who are fighting against this. I applaud you, and we're going to get it done. The governor cannot stand in the way of anyone trying to save a life. And that's all we're trying to do is to save lives. I'm grateful uh, that that is what we're doing. And I hope that we will be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. And thank you so much for being here, for lifting and using your voice um, on this important issue. Next speaker we have is Jackie Anderson, who is the president of the Houston Federation of Teachers. Good afternoon, Jamar. Um, first, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be the voice of 6,500 teachers in the state of Texas. This is, should be a time that teachers are happy and teachers are filled with anticipation for meeting their students. I know it was for me in the entire 33 years that I was a teacher. I was always happy knowing that I was going to go back and see my students. However, this is not such a happy time for teachers in Texas. The governor is asking us to put our lives in danger. And this is so unnecessary. A simple thing like wearing a mask could save a life. And yet the governor is refusing to put in a mask mandate. He's saying that this districts do not have to contact Trace. And that those who refuse to follow his ridiculous mandate will be fined. That is so horrible. It is a political monstrosity and it is unnecessary. Um, teachers have called me each and every day filled with fear, they are, some talk about retiring, some talk about just flat out quitting the profession, and that would be a travesty. Teachers know, our local our leaders know what is best for our area. We know what our students need. We are closer to the ground than Governor Abbott, and they should be allowed, our local leaders should be allowed to make the decision about what is best for our areas in our school districts. We applaud Superintendent House in his um, announcement that he intends to impose a mass mandate in the Houston Independent School District. And we're asking our teachers to please mask up. We're asking them if they haven't been vaccinated to please do so. We know we have a population of students, the elementary under 12, who cannot be vaccinated at this time. But we ask those teachers who are in those elementary classrooms to please be vaccinated and please wear your mask. It comes a time in life when you have to look out for yourself and your family and your communities if you have leaders who are not willing to do so. And so this is that time, this is a call to action our educators to please look out for yourself. We know that, um, you know, we're filled at this particular time, the teachers are filled with fear, but we must overcome that fear and start to look at what's best for us in our communities and our families. And that is at this point to wear your mask and please be vaccinated. Thank you for giving me voice for our teachers. 
Thank you so much, Jackie. And thank you for being a voice for so many teachers, not only in Houston, but all across the state. So our next speaker that we will have is Dr. Victor Trevino, who is the health authority for the city of Laredo. Dr. Trevino. Yes, thank you and good afternoon, Dr. Victor Trevino, health authority for the city of Laredo. I do wanna thank you for inviting me to this important discussion about COVID-19 and the medical impact it has on our, on our children in school settings. Now, in the last week alone, we're seeing close to 94,000 COVID cases in children throughout the country, primarily due to the Delta virus variant, which is more contagious and infectious. And in Texas, that's a jump from two weeks ago where we saw the overall increase of 156% in new infections and 88% increase in hospitalizations and also 95% increase in the deaths due to COVID-19. And unfortunately, Texas and Florida alone account only account for one in three of all new infections in the United States in the past week. Only 44 of Texans are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and this is below the national average. So we are in a high transmission environment in Texas, and Laredo has reported zero ICU beds for the last seven days. Our medically underserved border community was number one in the country for new cases per capita during the earlier waves. And we have no pediatric ICU and we did not have a pedi pediatric ICU then. Now these disturbing facts are in light of the pandemic data released from the CDC that show that Hispanic children were about eight times as likely as non-Hispanic white children to be hospitalized with African-American children being five times as likely. Schools have, also, have always been a safe environment for the development of children, but this has always been assured because we have followed the signs behind the prevention of illnesses and disease with our schools. And the science and the data has shown that absent a vaccine, which is very effective, makes the single most important mitigation tool to protect children from infection. And as a health authority and a local doctor, I have treated several children with COVID-19 in my clinic. And the governor's executive order banning mitigation, specifically masks in school, is going to lead to more pediatric infections and hospitalizations. I am all for personal responsibility, but five-year-olds depend on their parents. And we have already seen misinformed, misinformed parents sending their children uh, who may be potentially carrying coronaviruses to school environments. This impacts the safety of school environments, which is the reason why the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics are re recommending for children above the age of two to wear masks. And this notion that only a few kids will die from completely preventable disease, as a doctor, this should not be acceptable to anyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Trevino. Thank you for being here and thank you for um, being on the front lines um, as well. So our next speaker we have is uh, Rose Rangel, uh, who is a COVID community board advisory member and also parent to a San Antonio public school student. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm Rosemary Gutierrez, a mother of a, of a student in the San Antonio public school system and daughter of a lost loved one to COVID, um, as he said, with marked by COVID. Uh, and I'm also a mechanical engineer married to an HVAC engineer with friends in the industry. Um, at this moment, my 10 year old is set to go back to school unvaccinated and unmasked. When we say pandemic of the unvaccinated, I'm thinking of my child. His only protection is his mask because the vaccine is not yet available to him. I know Greg was, uh, Abbott was one of the first Texans to get vaccinated and he has enjoyed his freedom of being unmasked, but it's not a freedom or privilege shared with our children younger than 12 years of age. As a mechanical engineer, I'd like a moment to explain why masking is important and it has to do with air quality inside buildings and our lack of ability to regulate every room to the same quality. Indoor quality is only as good as its corresponding HVAC system in whatever building you're in. Experts in the HVAC industry agree that more outdoor is required to promote respiratory health. Increasing filtration um, can help where newer HVAC systems exist, but where there are older units, 
It's not as simple as trading out a filter. In such cases, the use of a higher grade filter will reduce the designed airflow, which will not help mitigate the virus. System upgrades where the HVA systems do not support a higher load due to increased outdoor air or filtration can be very costly per building. Not every building has the capacity of upgrading due to funding and time. We're currently fighting the third wave of this COVID variant, so ramping up, uh, revamping any HVAC systems now is just too late. Uh, we'll have to wait till hospitalizations decrease. Other alternatives include ultraviolet, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation treatment, um, which can be used to treat air ducts to enhance the cleaning inside central ventilation systems, air purifiers to help mitigate the spread of the virus inside spaces, and those can be purchased at, I don't know, Walmart or Costco, um, and proper social distancing. But without the option for virtual learning, proper social distancing measures are nearly impossible in some classroom settings. So it comes back to air quality. And I like for, like for everyone to think for a second about the air you breathe uh, indoors and how little you know about it. And still the best way to mitigate the spread of the virus and keep our children protected is to provide them with a well-fitted and clean surgical mask, K95 mask or an M95 mask, a five layer mask. We need to teach our children about proper masking. We need to discuss when a soiled mask should be replaced. Our children need protection, especially those in areas most affected by COVID during the first wave, like the Rio Grande Valley. Um, as Dr. Trevino mentioned, Hispanic and Black children are extremely vulnerable. Um, we need to protect them. And the virus is nonpartisan, nonpolitical, and the response to the current and dire situation against COVID must also be nonpolitical. In the second wave of the virus, Greg Abbott allowed school districts to act according to what their counties were experiencing in not allowing school districts to decide upon test Texas this school meeting districts is and being their superintendents recorded. to protect our children in public schools. We, we know maybe many pri private schools are actually mandating mask wearing, including the school where Ted, Ted Cruz's kids go to. Um, and the pandemic response should be no different, regardless of where you live or how much you make. As a member of Marked by COVID, it's my urgent request for Greg Abbott to listen and pledge to mask up and slow the, pre slow, slow the spread and protect the unvaccinated, our children. Please, uh, I just don't want him to become the next governor to regret a ban on mask mandates. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And thank you for being here and um, using your voice today. Up next, we have um, Annette Reyes Morales, who is a social worker, but also a parent to a student in El Paso Public Schools. Annette. Good afternoon. And thank you very much to, for inviting me. Um, I am a former social worker. I worked for many years in San Antonio and we relocated to El Paso where my spouse and I grew up. And I am the mother to a nine-year-old, um, to a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. And they have always attended public school. My husband and I attended public school. We went to public universities as well. So we're very much uh, for public school education. But last June, when Governor Abbott decided to ban masks in schools or to no longer mandate mask wearing in schools, um, we became very concerned because during that time, our children were still in public school. They were learning virtually and they were still doing well. And from our point of view, they were protected because they were home. But we did look forward to sending them back, back in the classroom to be with their teachers and their friends and their schoolmates. Well, here in El Paso, school started August 2nd. So we had to make a difficult decision, which was to pull them out of public school and instead homeschool them because we just did not feel comfortable enough sending our children to a public school setting where masks would be optional and not enforceable um, by their teachers or their principals or their counselors. So we decided to keep them home 
and pull them out of public school. It is a difficult decision to do that as a parent, as a parent who's very much for public school, but it is also a challenge to envision sending your, basically your heart walking out into the world and feeling like you cannot protect them the six plus hours that they are away from you. So we chose to public to homeschool both our children. Um, both my husband and I are fully vaccinated and we did that to protect our children. Our extended family is fully vaccinated and we did that to protect our grandparents and our aunts and uncles who might have additional um, chronic illnesses. But now our focus has shifted to protecting our children. And this was before we realized Delta variant was coming down the pipe. And now we are especially thankful that we made the decision that we made. But we hope that one day, once we are past this pandemic, that we will be able to send them back to public school. But the biggest obstacle was the simplest, which was to wear a mask in a public school setting to protect not only our children, but the children that are around them every day. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Annette, and thank you for being here with us today. And our last speaker uh, this afternoon is Caroline Sweet, um, who is an Austin educator, cancer survivor, and also a parent to a student in Austin public schools. So, Caroline. Thanks, Jamar. Thanks for having me today. You know, at times absent from this conversation are the voices of the kids and adults who are already in the classrooms or will step back into classrooms very soon. But I urge you, talk to the kids. They're worried. They want to protect their friends. They want to protect their families. And me as a teacher, I'm just one voice, but I know I speak for many teachers, many families, many students that urgently need school districts to implement mask mandates. You know, there's a reason I stand by the monkey bars at recess duty. It's where kids get hurt. And there's a reason we keep brooms in the hiding spots in our classrooms, because we've been told in active shooter training to locate anything we might use to fight off danger. Every teacher enters a classroom with the intention to protect the children we care for, the children we educate. And it is our moral obligation and ethical responsibility. And since we know that masks are the single most important non-pharmaceutical intervention for fighting this disease, that is what we will use. I'm so proud of Austin ISD, of Houston, of Dallas for making the decision to put the health and safety of kids above the threat of financial consequences from the government. We hope that this paves the way for other districts, urban, suburban, rural, to be brave, step forward, and do what's right for kids. Look, we understand that the financial consequences of implementing a mask mandate might be severe, even absurd. But I ask that across Texas, that we come together as a community of teachers, of students, of families, health professionals, advocates, and continue to push for the health and safety of all of our kids. As a teacher, every day, I'm asked to be brave as I step back into the classroom. And it is time for all of us to be brave and do what's right for kids. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for being here. Thank you for using your voice as well. And thank you to all of our speakers for joining us this afternoon. We do have just a few minutes for questions. We do want to remind members of the media that joined us today to please put your question along with the outlet that you are representing um, also in the chat. Um, we do have um, a request, actually. Um, in the meantime, we have a request for uh, Spanish remarks. Um, so we do have members of the Spanish media. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Trevino or Chairman Hinojosa, do either of you have um, remarks that you could provide in uh, Spanish or Caroline um, as well? One of the three of you um, for the Spanish media that's joined us today. Yes, definitely. This is Dr. Trevino. I could uh, go ahead and give some uh, remarks in Spanish. <clears throat> and uh, buenas tardes a todos. Para repetir lo que dijimos en inglés, 
Soy el doctor Treviño, autoridad de salud de la ciudad de Laredo, Texas. Y les doy gracias al comité este por invitarme para hablar de, esta, de este tema tan importante. Hemos visto que últimamente ha habido más niños infectados en Estados Unidos y se ve que la ola que viene va a involucrar más a más a los niños. Y hemos visto que el incremento ha sido tremendamente en, en menores de 12 años, los que no tienen las vacunas. Y también sabemos que el estado de Texas tiene menos del 44% de, de vacunados. Y eso es menor que, el, que la, las cifras nacionales. Así es que estamos viendo que las transmisiones están muy altas en el estado de Texas y específicamente en la ciudad de Laredo tenemos pocos recursos, tenemos capacidades de cero camas de cuidado intensivo y no tenemos camas pediátricas como en muchos lugares, otro, en otros lugares de Texas. Y tenemos que estar conscientes que el, los niños al regresar a la escuela en ambientes uh, que no se, no se exige el, el tapabocas, la máscara, y que no hay personas vacunadas debajo de la edad de 12 años, este es un ambiente donde el riesgo de la infección de coronavirus es alto. Sin esfuerzos de mitigación va a ser muy difícil de tener que se hagan uh, oleadas o uh, auges de infecciones del coronavirus. Así es que sabemos que esto va a impactar a los en, en, entornos es, escolares y por esa razón la CDC y la Academia Americana de Pediatría está recomendando que los niños arriba de dos años en estos ambientes usen el tapabocas. Y la noción que o sea, solamente poquitos niños se enfermarán o morirán de una enfermedad completamente prevenible es una idea errónea y no sería aceptable, no debe ser aceptable para nadie. Gracias. Thank you, uh, Dr. Trevino. Thank you very much. Caroline, did you have anything to add? I saw you come off mute. I just want to be sure. Sure. Um, estamos pidiendo a todos los padres de familia, todas las comunidades que pidan en sus escuelas, sus distritos, que requieren tap tapabocas o cubrebocas en las escuelas. Es la, la cosa más efectiva que tenemos para prevenir, prevenir uh, el contagio de este virus. Así que tenemos que juntar nuestras voces y cuando estamos hablando juntos, tenemos más poder. Thank you so much, Caroline. And um, we do have one question um, also. Um, we have a question for Jackie, actually, Jackie Anderson, president of the Houston Federation of Teachers. Um, and the, I'll read the question directly, um, that obviously the governor has issued a statement on ISD mass mandates. It doubled down on his position of refusing mass mandates and advocates, again, for personal responsibility. So from the teacher's perspective or educator's perspective, How do you respond to the personal responsibility argument? And um, we may take comments from a couple other folks if time permits. Well, sure. Everyone has a personal responsibility to look out for their health and safety. However, a, an elected official shares a great deal of the responsibility. They are elected. They are elected. And their first priority should be for the care and safety of their constituents. And that's where the governor has failed us tremendously. We are, like I said, asking our teachers to mask up. We have a campaign asking them to mask up and be vaccinated as well. But we are still holding him personally responsible for this careless and reckless act that he is uh, issuing with a no mask, uh, the no mask mandate, a ban on masks. Thank you so much, President Anderson, for that response. Also, um, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, I would love to um, see if you have a response to this point about how do you respond to the personal responsibility argument? Thank you so very much uh, for uh, the question. Um, I, I respond with a sense of indignation uh, about uh, one substituting for the other. I, I Don't tell me about personal responsibility when uh, orders are stopping responsible school districts, businesses, colleges, from issuing a mandatory mask uh, requirement. 
or you don't even have in place mandatory vaccinations for uh, the uh, parents and children 12 and up that can take them at this point in time or essential workers uh, or uh, others on the front lines. So the idea of personal responsibility and to have that uh, alleviate, uh, eliminate the responsibility of government. And remember when I started out by saying people vote to live, they don't vote to die. They vote for elected officials that will give them a direction to live. And so personal responsibility is fine, uh, but give people the opportunity to exercise that personal responsibility. And that is to advocate for masks for their children and for the children that sit next to their children and for their teachers. And thank you to uh, the Houston Federation of Teachers and also AFT uh, with their president who made a powerful statement this week. Um, President Ryan Gardner on the idea of teachers across America. So no, I don't take personal responsibility to substitute for the governmental responsibility, emergency responsibility. I welcome personal responsibility in terms of people not rejecting vaccinations and not rejecting wearing masks. If that is the answer, I, I accept it on that category, but I also realize that the government has responsibility to help jurisdictions do the right thing and save lives. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Um, and we have um, another question also that's come in from uh, Dallas Univision. So we probably are asking for a Spanish response here. Um, but the question is, is there a fear from teachers and superintendents that the governor will withhold teacher salaries similar to what the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis is doing? Um, so Caroline, um, if we can have a Spanish response to, um, to this question, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, certainly. Creo que sí estamos todos asustados de lo que va a pasar, de la co consecuencia que el gobierno va a imponer a nuestros distritos que van a querer cubrir bocas en la escuela. Pero, ¿qué es el precio de la vida de un niño? No hay un precio. O sea, son tan importantes para nuestra comunidad que no podemos poner precio. Y si nos van a multar, que nos multen. Que la deuda sea gigante, pero no queremos perder ningún niño, ninguna vida, ningún miembro de sus familias tampoco. Así que por esa razón tenemos que requerir uh, cubrebocas en todas las escuelas. Thank you very much as well. Thank, thank you, Caroline. Appreciate that as well. Okay, so... Um, Jackie, I saw you come off mute, so I want to be mindful if you have a response to that question. Oh, oh, you're on mute. I was actually trying to make sure that I was muted. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and then also, Caroline, to that, um, your response, could you also give that in English as well? Oh, sure, Jimmer. <laughs> um, you know, there's not a price we can put on the lives of children. The fine that is threatened and might very well be imposed, it could go into the billions for districts. It certainly could affect the functioning of our district, but there is not a price that we're going to put on the life of a child. It is the responsibility of our community to keep all kids safe. And there is no debt big enough that would hinder us from doing that. So we are going to step into school buildings. We are going to require masks. We're going to defy Governor Abbott in this case, and we're going to accept this enormous debt that may come. And the consequences might be severe. And I ask that all Texans come together to support, to support the students and teachers and families because we're not going to lose a kid. We're just not. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you all so much. I want to take time to thank all of our speakers. I know we didn't get to get to all of the questions, but we do want to be mindful of time. Uh, we know that folks are very busy um, making sure that we're protecting our students, making sure we're protecting our children and our community. So thank you to all of the speakers who joined us today. Um, if we did not get to your question, please make sure that you message us. Um, so please reach out to our communications and our press team. Um, and that email is press at txdemocrats.org. Again, that is press 
at txdemocrats.org. And we've also, for those of you in the Zoom, dropped in the chat. So again, we are all in this fight together to increase our public health awareness and to make sure that we're protecting our children and all of those in our communities. And the Texas Democratic Party uh, stands with, with our communities and making sure that we do just that. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for the work that you're doing all across the state. 